from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Today is Tuesday, July 19, 2011. My name is Joe Munier of the Southern Oral History Program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm in New York City with our project videographer, John Bishop, to do an interview for the Civil Rights History Project, which is a joint undertaking of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And we're delighted and uh, appreciative to have a chance today to be with you, Dr. A. Alfred Moldovan, um, to talk about your work with the Medical Committee for Human Rights and, and otherwise. So thanks very much for coming over to sit down with us. Let me have you start, if you would, by just talking a little bit about um, your family and um, you're born in the Bronx and, and your parents. No, I was born in, oh. I was born in Manhattan. I was born in, in uh, Hungarian Yorkville, which at that time extended from uh, uh, 79th Street to 72nd Street. German Yorkville was from 86th Street to 79th, and from 79th to 72nd was Hungarian Yorkville, which at that time was Jewish. So there was a large Jewish contingent there. I was born on, 70, on East 74th Street, and then I moved to 76th Street, and then we moved to the Bronx. Tell me a little bit about yeah. your parents. My father was a uh, baker, bread baker, worked for the Pechter Baking Company. He had been a, uh, uh, what do you call these guys that chop down trees in forests? Uh, lumberjack. He was a lumberjack in Hungary in the Carpathian Mountains. Uh, no, uh, no training of any kind. Uh, uh, my mother was a seamstress. She was educated. She spoke a number of languages besides all the languages they all had to speak because the town that they were born in, you walked a foot in each direction, you were in a different country, Hungary, Romania, Poland, Czechoslovakia. So, um, but I uh, grew up speaking Yiddish. In fact, I didn't speak English until I started public school. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they're talking about bilingual education. I didn't have any bilingual education. I spoke only Yiddish, and uh, I, I kept it that way, you know, although my mother tried very hard <laughs> to have me teach her English. I was not a very good son. I wanted to speak Yiddish for some weird reason, and I never spoke anything but uh, Yiddish to her. Mm -hmm. um. When did your folks come to the United States? Well, my father came first in 14. Um, poverty. <laughs> poor you, poor you wouldn't imagine. My sister tells the story that uh, when uh, mother would go out to, on a job as a seamstress and it was raining, uh, she would have to stay home and stay in bed because there was only one pair of shoes to go through the muddy streets, the streets of the Stadel, the little, the little village. To, that, that they lived in. I don't know if there were a hundred people in it. They were all relatives. Sure. So uh, he came here in 14, and then he went back to get my sister and her uh, in 20. And I was made on the boat, and I was born in 21. How about, um, how about uh, a description of your community um, coming up and then, and then the move to the Bronx? I have no recollection of the York, Yorkville community at all. I, I remember the Bronx. We moved, the first place we moved in the Bronx was the Brook Avenue, which was uh, in the East Bronx near, near Claremont Park. Uh, I have no recollection of it. I do remember uh, we had a large extended family. Everybody that came from Europe that had no place to go came and lived with us. So I was raised by uncles and aunts and cousins and. Uh, in fact, when my mother uh, gave birth to me, she was sick for a year with a bilateral lobon pneumonia, which at that time was uh, totally fatal, but she lived through it. Uh, and had another son after me, and, but he died of diphtheria. Uh, so I was raised by my sister and my aunt and my uncles. A real extended family, very close. Sure. Yes. Um, you attended public schools? Public school, yeah. yeah. All public schools. Uh, 
fine public schools. One of the greatest educational experiences I had was junior high school. Went to the Herman Ritter Junior High School, PS 98, in, uh, in the East Bronx, which was at that time, it was the second year of its existence. It was an experimental school. A whole major new concept of learning. Uh, and uh, it was a great school. I, it produced a lot of, a lot of very important people. Uh, I remember one of them specifically, Professor Ruth Barkin, who uh, became a worldwide uh, known uh, philosopher, the head of the Yale Department of Philosophy for many years. Barkin's Law in uh, Logic is named after her. And there were many such. It was a remarkable, remarkable group of people. Yeah. Coming up, did you have a, um, was your household political? Was it a No, team? no, no, no. My father was a good union man. He did what he, what he was told. He went on picket lines because in those days, uh, if uh, an outfit went out on strike, everybody in the union took part in, in picketing one day. Uh, but he had no political. He was a reader of the Tug, which was the Democrat Party newspaper. There was a Tug, the, the Republicans had their own, the Communists had their own, the Socialists had their own. There were four major newspapers. He read the Tug, so you know where he stood. But he never he read the paper from cover to cover, but uh, had absolutely no political interest at all. Your mother? Nothing, no. Mother was a classical, old time Jewish housewife, although there was a time when we were in pretty bad shape that she took in uh, ties. She, she uh, sewed ties to make extra money. Yes, I remember. Neckties. Uh, neckties, yes, yes. You, you make a necktie, you get the thing, and, and I used to sit there and, and thread needles for her. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. When did you first start to come into the politics that would define so much of your contribution and your work? Uh, well, I was exposed to it at City College. City College, you know, in those days it was called the Harvard of the working class. City College in my day produced more PhD candidates than all the Ivy League schools put together at that time. And I graduated in 42. It was quite an establishment, and quite a lot of important people there. Uh, I didn't take part because I, I couldn't afford to. I went to school in the morning. I went to work in the afternoon. I went back to school at night, okay? So in the morning I took my lab uptown in City College and I went down to 34th Street and I worked at the Oppenheim Collins building for uh, as a, uh, an assistant resident buyer in house furnishing and toys. And then when I finished there, I went down to 23rd Street for my non-science uh, courses. And Saturdays, uh, took courses. And if I had any day off at all, I worked. Uh, my first vacation I ever had was when I went into the Army. Uh, mm -hmm. I worked all the time. I worked Christmas and Easter. And if it was a day off, I worked. Yeah. So I didn't have any time for anything. Yeah. When, um, when did you uh, start thinking about medicine? Oh, I've always uh, never, never thought I'd get into medical school because in my day, uh, there were about 150 pre-med students at City College. Uh, three guys got into medical school. One of them wasn't Jewish. One of them's father was a professor at Long Island College of Medicine, and one of them had already written a book in comparative anatomy. So what chance did I have? I figured, I figured that I would uh, try to get in by the back door. I would go for a PhD in bacteriology and then try to get into my, oh, I've never wanted anything else. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. What, what um, I know this is a question with a wide answer, but what, um, what did you think and feel in Pearl Harbor and the next day when you enrolled in the Air Force? Yes, uh, that was uh, what you're supposed to do. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't waiting for anybody to call me. Yeah. Yeah. 
What? Um, See, I live with a with a with a motto that I picked up somewhere: justify your existence. Justify your existence. You can't just exist. Yeah. You have to justify. Did you after um, after enlisting? Did you were you allowed then to finish out the college? No, no. I yes, on? yes, yes. No. I when I I fi finished. And then they asked me if I wanted to go into the army as a private or wait till I get called up because there was no room. They had just begun the program uh, and uh, there was just no room for class. So I said, well, oh, I'll wait. I'm not, I'll, I'll go in as a cadet. And uh, no short than a few months, I went to work in the uh, signal laboratories in, in Belmont, New Jersey as a uh, radio mechanic. I knew about much about radio mechanics, as probably you do. But, uh, you know, they wanted people with scientific background, which I had, math and physics and all of that. So I worked as a radio mechanic at the Belmar Radar Laboratories. And from there I was called to active duty. And I took the train down to Boca Raton, Florida. From Boca Raton, I went to Yale and got my bars. And after that, they sent me to Harvard and MIT to become an electronic specialist and uh, went overseas with the 15th Air Force, 455th Bomb Group stationed in Foggia, Italy, uh, with the B-24s first and then with the B-17s. And I had a group of uh, 200 mechanics who uh, tended to the radar equipment on the heavy bombers. Were you in Italy throughout the... Yes, until the war ended, and then I was supposed to go to the uh, Pacific on the B-29, but the uh, fact is I felt like staying behind. I had become quite fluent in many languages, and I thought I'd stay behind with UNRWA as a uh, translator. So I was pretty fluent in Italian, German, French. Then I got a telegram from my sister that mother was sick, come home. So I gave up the idea of staying behind and I went home and I got to her just as she was being wheeled down into the operating room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, uh, you went to medical school in Chicago? Went to Chicago Medical School, yes. Mm -hmm. Chicago Medical School at that time was one of three medical schools left after the Flexner Report. Flexner Report was commissioned by the AMA to get rid of the medical schools in the United States that didn't deserve to be medical schools. There were many. So he, uh, he divided the medical schools into A, B, and C schools. And A school was fine, they would go on. B schools had to make certain adjustments, get more money, get better teachers, et cetera, et cetera. and C schools had to be closed. So they closed all the C schools, and they had left three B schools. One of mine was Chicago Medical School. And through the efforts of the dean at that time, a man by the name of John J. Shinin, who single-handedly took this school and turned it into a grade A school, raised the money, got the people, and uh, by the time I graduated, the school was grade A school, and we could practice anywhere at all. Um, had that not occurred, I would have been forced to practice in Illinois, because that was the only school that would allow me to take a license. After that, the national exam was available to me. So that shows you how badly I wanted to be a doctor. Do you have GI Bill support? For yes, you? yes, yeah, yeah. yes, sure. Yeah. And I also worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, GI Bill was, you know, a piece of the action. That's My father supplied a lot of the money. Yeah. And I worked after school. I taught Sunday school on Sunday and worked in an industrial doctor's office at night to make extra money. Yeah. Through the war service and military service and um, medical school, did you... Are there interesting things to say about the evolution of your personal ideologies, perspectives, values that would motivate the decision to... Didn't, 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 didn't 
have the time or energy for it at that time. I was in the middle of a war. I wasn't going to worry about politics. I was going to worry about making sure that my machines were working right and that we were winning the war. And I was not. Uh, I was not a political animal in, in that sense. I mean, it, it was all there in the back, but uh, it didn't come out. The same as in City College. You know, I was attracted to all the smart guys there that were doing all the great things, but I, I didn't have the time. I you worked, you know, I worked night and day, and politics is a luxury. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what brought you back to the Spanish Army? Uh, well, I, I became political in, in medical school, I I yes. I became quite political in medical school. I helped found uh, a major organization, the Association of Interns and Medical Students. Uh, that was the first student organization since the Washington destroyed the American Student Union, the ASU. The ASU was a major uh, uh, political organization of the youth of the United States. It was very successful, very forward-looking, but then again they red-baited it out of existence. So there was nothing at that time until we organized the Association of Interns and Medical Students, which was uh, quite successful until it was red-baited out of existence. Uh, I helped found the American Veterans Committee, AVC, uh, which was red-baited out of existence. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. you know, it started, it started in medical school. It yeah. started with things that we had to do, you know, trying to get together. I remember we went to integrate the beaches in South Chicago. Uh, Excuse me. We're back after after a short break, Dr. Mulgan. Can you say a little bit more about about uh, the factors, experiences in, in during medical school that that brought out this commitment to a certain kind of progressive politics? And well, there are a group of us there who uh, realized that uh, medicine was a very white male oriented endeavor, and something should be done about recruiting minority people and women into medicine. There was, there was one single woman in my medical school class. Uh, there were, I think, none before that. Uh, thought that was wrong. <coughs> thought that was wrong, and we, some of us got together and tried to do things about it. We went and lectured in high schools around the state of Illinois to interest minority students to apply themselves and try to get into medical school. And uh, yeah. any, any, any range of inspirations in, in alerting you and making you aware of it? It's an unusual thing for a white male medical student in the mid-50s to care about these things, to be, even to be alert to these things. Do you well, you, if, you, if, you, if you surround yourself with the right kind of people, and my friends were the right kind of people, so we all had the same, you know, we started developing the same outlook and saying, you know, it's like uh, we formed the AIMS, the Association of Interns and Medical Students, you know. I remember we had the first convention. I was elected a national publicity agent for it. Um, but like with everything else, uh, Washington interfered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, height of the Cold War and Red Scare mm -hmm. and all that, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you came to, you came back to New York in 1954 and opened a practice. Uh, I came, I graduated in 50, went to my internship in the Bronx, uh, Montefiore Hospital, took a year's pathology residency in Brooklyn at the Maimonides Hospital and two years of internal medicine at Kings County Hospital. And then uh, I got married by that time. My wife was a school teacher and I went to open an office. And uh, 
I thought the best place would be uh, somewhere where I could be useful, where I can justify my existence and not be worried about taking, making a lot of money. Of course, with disappointment to my father, who always envisioned, you know, I would be a Park Avenue doctor and buy a big house where he can come and putter around. That's all he wasn't, you know, he wasn't interested in, in my being rich for the sake of being rich. He wanted a big house. He was an incredible craftsman. He could do anything, plumbing, carpentry, you name it. He, I remember during the Depression, he would he would uh, use a handheld last and, and, and do our shoes. Yeah, yeah. yeah he was a... Did, yeah. did your politics or your choice about how to move into medicine, did this put you at odds or in tension with your family? Or no, 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 no. My parents never interfered with me with anything, anything. I wasn't told to go to medical school. I wasn't told where to practice medicine or how to practice or what. All I can say is my father was disappointed because he had no place to put. So I finally brought him down to the office. He was puttering around in the office in East Harlem, you know, fixed things and did things. But uh, yeah, my family is uh, very strange. I did what I had to do. Uh, I remember an instance when my sister came to Chicago for my graduation. Uh, and one of my classmates' mothers turned to her and says, uh, aren't you proud your brother's a doctor? She said, what should he be, a street cleaner? I said, no big deal. It was uh, <laughs> like my sainted mother. When I, when I got my bars at Yale, I said, uh, you want to come up and see me get my bars? And so she said in Yiddish, I don't, I don't even know how to translate it for you. Uh, to the effect, big deal, an officer. <laughs> you know, what an officer meant to have, nothing, you know, big deal. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's, the, what's the pattern of your experience through the, through the from the mid-50s forward? In particular, I'm thinking about the community of um, progressive physicians that you would, you would become a, a, a part of here in, in New York, the Physicians Forum. Physicians Forum, yeah, there were, there were three sets of organizations. There was a Physicians Forum, that was an old one, that was started by a very great physician, Block, and his name starts with a B. Ed Barsky? But, no, no, Ed no. Barsky was uh, with me in, in, in the uh, medical committee. Yeah, he was one of my heroes. Uh, I don't know who he was. He'd know in a minute. He was a very important guy. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, Physicians Forum, that was one organization. Uh, I joined the County Medical Society. I became active in the Medical Society. I was on the Executive Committee of the Medical Society and head of the Medical Economics Committee for many years. Uh, uh, when Medicaid went into law, I was very active in seeing to it that it became a valid thing because at the beginning it was created to not to, not to, not to win. Not, not to function, it was purposely created, legally created, to be dysfunctional and fought for that in the medical society and with the medical society. And then a group of us got a call from, from the civil rights activists, we need, we need doctors, and uh, we met. The whole thing is described in, I'm sure you've, you've got the book, uh, uh, The Good Doctors. Exactly. Yes, and that's all. Yeah, we'll, we'll reach that, but I want to yes. ask you a little bit more. You're, I'm interested in, in, so you open a practice, you're in um, East Harlem. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the, your, your, your patients, the folks you, the folks you help, the, uh, the community? Um, yeah, working class people, like my father. I had no problems, I had no, no prejudices, no, nobody bothered me. Yeah. I was held up twice in the years I was there, but yeah, hey, par for the course. People get held up in Park Avenue, you know, no big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it sounds as if your, your broad politics and commitments were already established before you came 
into your practice? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Um, did, did your work with um, the Physicians Forum, other groups? No, at Physicians Forum, I didn't work very much. I was mm -hmm. part of them. I, I supported them. I gave them money. Yeah. I attended meetings. But it wasn't until the Medical Committee for Human Rights okay. uh, that I helped found that I really became politically active. I took off time from work constantly. My accountant kept complaining, you keep that up, you don't have a practice, right? Because I would, you know, pick myself up, give my wife a package of cash and say, put this away in case I get picked up and sent to this for my, my bail money. She in turn would take that money always and take the kids somewhere to Washington, to Philadelphia. That was my bail money. <laughs> Thank God, and so I was never, I, I never needed it. But uh, so let, let's go to that. Let's go to that uh, early part of the summer of '64 yeah, yeah. when um, some folks do call on mm -hmm. uh, the physicians forum. Mm -hmm. Raise this question: Can can we find physicians to provide mm -hmm. some support to yes. the movement activists? Yes. Yes, yes, we did that, yes. We founded the first group meeting in Mike Holloman's office, um, and I was elected secretary treasurer. That means I had to raise the, help raise the money, and in two years, in 1964, I helped raise uh, half a million dollars. Do you know what that's like today? That's big money, big money. So through the summer of 64, um, you began this effort to, uh, I think the group was formally constituted um, late June, early July, mm -hmm. um, and you take up this charge to raise money and mm -hmm. get to work on that project. Mm -hmm. um, but you're also, I think, in um, Mississippi, later that summer. Yeah, I went to Meridian, yeah, yes. Exactly. Yes, I went. I, I, we 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 sent groups of doctors and nurses et cetera, to various places where they are needed. Uh, it was my turn, and I uh, I was went went to Meridian, Mississippi. I was there when they found the bodies in the in the dam. Could okay. Change one. Yeah. Good. Yes. Yes. And helped arrange for uh, David Spain to come down to do another autopsy because the autopsy that was done officially there was sheer nonsense. And David was asked to come down and he performed a proper autopsy and showed how how the kids died. Yeah. yeah. So I spent I spent my first my first tour uh, was in Meridian, Mississippi. Yeah. Let me ask you, I, I know um I know some of those memories probably are very sharp. Some have probably faded into a wider pattern of all your recollections of your work. Um, but if, if you if you if you move very slowly in the description, what was it like to arrive and you know, even to travel there and then to arrive in Meridian, Mississippi, in the summer of 1964? Can you? It was a different you? world. I mean, I just didn't know it. I didn't understand it. I, you know, I'd never been any place. I mean. I remember an incident when I was, when I was in, just when I had just gotten to, to uh, Boca Raton, Florida, when I was a, an aviation cadet, and I was standing on the side of the road waiting for a bus, and I got into the bus, and there's some seats empty in the back, and I walked to the back, and the bus driver pulled the bus over to the side and said, soldier, you don't get out of the back, this bus doesn't move. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. I wasn't supposed to sit in the back. So, you know, I was a, an ignorant northern white in a different world. I didn't know the world. Hey, had you worked with, um, with black soldiers in the war? No. Not much at all? No, right? no, no. The Air Force? Yeah. No, there were no, no. None at all. No. I, I, did, I did meet some of the guys in Naples who were with the uh, fighter group, the black fighter group. I remember them, but... Uh, when, when in your life did you first have an opportunity to really spend much time with African Americans? Never. Even up through the summer of 64, yeah, no, no. No, no, no. In high school, I was in a separated class. I was in a, 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 a 
special classes, you know. So maybe there was one Afro-American kid in, in that whole group. And certainly, I don't remember any in in junior high school. A couple here and there, and in, in uh, public school. But uh, yeah. I remember a black kid in Hebrew school. Sorry. Yep, yep. Never forget that. Mm -hmm. Went to Hebrew school in Washington Avenue, and. Uh, it was a black kid there. I'll never forget that. It was a long, How long was time ago. Excuse me, we're going to stop for a sec. I want to change drives. Okay. And we're on. We're back after a short break. Dr. Mulvan, um, tell me a little bit more about, about Meridian. Um, where did you stay? What? Stayed at a hotel. Uh, it's a very hazy yeah. time. I, I can't remember too much of it. Yeah. Uh, Visited people and uh, you know helped tried uh, the 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 organizers of uh, of uh, that were down there. Freedom Summer. For the uh, yeah Freedom Summer. Uh, you know, our job was to lend, quote unquote lend a presence. We couldn't do anything medically. We lent a presence so people would know that people are watching. Uh, yeah, so well, I wanted to ask about the yeah. could not provide medical services. There was a reaction by the state. Authorities in the South to this oh, type of oh, sure. Can you describe that? Oh, sure. Well, uh, you couldn't practice medicine. You took your life in your hands. You, you could practice first aid. Uh, you could give advice. You could send people to the hospital, but you couldn't practice medicine. And and our our job was not to practice medicine, but to lend a presence people that know we're there, and I, you say, you will hear in the speech that I made for the second march, you know, we will be there, we'll be there wherever you are. Right. You know, that's a, that I think sums up the whole essence of the Medical Committee for Human Rights. We will be there. Sure, sure. Um, let me just ask you a, a bit more as well about the, on the, upon the recovery of the bodies of Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner. Mm -hmm. um, can you situate that demand and effort on the part of the committee for a, for a additional uh, autopsy? Well, that was it. You know, the, the, the people in the movement were very dissatisfied. Uh, the, the, the SNCC, and don't forget there are so many different groups involved, and uh, it was just atrocious. The, the medical report, the autopsy report that had been given by the, by the official pathologist of Meridian, Mississippi, which was absolutely untrue, you know, and uh, David Spain, a very important uh, Brooklyn pathologist, uh, told it how it was. Yeah. And that Did you have any contact with white Mississippi, I mean, well, Mississippi physicians when you were no, there? No, no, no. No, yeah. no. How about with those that small number of black Mississippi physicians? I know had nothing to do with them. Yeah. No, okay. no, yeah. no. Um, through the fall of um, fall of sixty four, the the committee is expanding, opening chapters in different cities, mm -hmm. and, um, many of them beyond the South. Yes, uh, yes, yes, and, yes. And come spring of um, sixty five, mm -hmm. uh, as the as the effort is made to push for voting rights in and around Selma, um, the committee and you yourself will be mm -hmm. drawn down, and can you? Well, you no, know, we were sent. We were sent. We, remember, it was, a, it was part of being a member of the MCHR that you would devote X amount of time uh, to this project, and uh, it was my turn. So, um, I, as I said, I went down with uh, uh, Ginny Wells, Aaron Wells's Aaron Wells' wife at that time. Aaron became the next chairman of the medical committee after Mike, and I went down with Virginia to, uh, to uh, Selma, and I was there um, when the young people decided they're going to march on Montgomery. Um, Dr. King wasn't there. He never gave permission. That was a rogue move on the part of the Snickers, and uh, 
you know what the result of that was, okay? They got terribly beaten up, I was tear gassed. Uh, you know the whole story. It's all. It's all, all please, please recall it because we're filming. And it's oh, nice to have it well, from direct, direct observer, participant. The 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 committee had obtained the use of am vehicles to use as ambulances, uh, a hearse or something. Like that. I was I was in one vehicle. There were a number of them. And we got to the Pettus Bridge, and the people were streaming back over the bridge. And uh, the sheriff was standing there, and he wouldn't let me cross. Uh, and Omar said, the people are hurt. I, I've got to go there and, and, and help them. And you know, I got to go. Uh, and he said, you don't just go from here, I'll blow your head off. You know, uh, and he wasn't kidding. Uh, it was a terrible scene. Uh, there were people streaming across the bridge, uh, crying, uh, limping, in injured. Uh, I remember John Lewis uh, had been beaten on the head and had a concussion. He was sent to the hospital. Um, uh, and he wouldn't let me cross. And I, 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 I don't know, I don't remember the moment, but I crossed. I was the only one that crossed the bridge and got to the other side went into houses to drag people out, you know, who had been, had been uh, gassed. Uh, I can still smell the gas. Um, the, the shoes and the things laying on the side and the, the, the goons with their clubs lining the road, uh, along with the, with the National Guard. It's a horrible scene, horrible scene. Anyway, got back from there, and they sent for Dr. King, and Dr. King came and uh, said he would go again. Washington was very upset about it. What we didn't know is that he made a deal with Washington, but uh, the night before we went this time with him, as when I spoke at the at the church, Brown Chapel, yeah. yeah, and told him what to do when the tear gas comes, and I told him not to, not to. If <laughs> the big joke was, I said, if you're knocked unconscious, make sure you have somebody with you. That made a, <laughs> that got a big laugh. That was the only laugh of the evening, uh, <laughs> because you know being knocked unconscious is very dangerous. You, if you recover. You don't know if you've got a concussion and uh, an hour later you're dead, you know. Somebody's got to know that you were unconscious. But that's, you can hear that in, in my speech. And uh, this time we, we marched to the edge of the bridge and knelt and prayed. That was the second march. Were you aware on that second march that that, was, that would no, be the No, 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 no. I was at the meetings. I was uh, I was at the meetings, uh, but don't forget Washington sent down uh, the Attorney General. What was his name at the, that time? I, don't, I remember seeing him there with. But we, I didn't. I don't think any of us knew the deal that he had made. Maybe maybe some of the the, the younger people did know. Uh, I'm sure the Abernathy knew, and and the young knew, but uh, I don't know if. Uh, anybody else, that, yeah. that he, he had agreed to stop uh, at the, not cross the bridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that at the time. But uh, one of the, one of the things he did, he did a lot of traveling around down there, and, and the deal was that I would sit on one side of him in, in the back of the car, and Ginny would sit on the other side of him, and if something came through the window, well, we would uh, take it. I was sure I'd take a bullet for him. You mean you thought it was likely to happen? Or yeah, you yeah. To no. It? no, no, I thought it was likely to happen. I, no big deal. What are the range of ways that, thinking back, that you 
that you manage to not get paralyzed in a situation. I don't, I, don't, I don't get paralyzed. It's, it's not my style. Okay? I, you know, I, I wasn't an active, but, uh, you know, what should I say, when I was in Italy, uh, I didn't do anything real dangerous. I flew in a couple of missions, but, you know, they were milk runs, uh, no big deal. I would, but I remember, for example, uh, going on a jeep, on a jeep uh, over the mountains to Naples in the winter time, and uh, you had a, it was the roads full of ice, and uh, in order to get down the hill, a group of uh, Italian laborers would have to hold the car and inch it down the hill, and it got away from them, and I'm hurtling down the hill. And this is what a what a way to go, but I I I'm not a hero. I'm you know, it, it's just not my style. I mean, I I just don't uh, don't think that way. Yeah. I re I never did. I still don't. You know. What was the what was the impression you you developed of Martin Luther King? Oh, I loved him. He was funny. He was interested. I remember one night we said talking all hours in the morning in the, in the basement of this dentist's house that they had taken over. And uh, he says to me, uh, what are you doing down here? And, you know, what, what's, what's your, what's, what, 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 I don't know, I'm trying to remember how he put it. He tried to involve my, 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 my religion, I said, well, I'm an atheist. I'm Jewish, but I'm an atheist. So he turns to Andy Young and says, look, look who's an atheist. You know, he's down here, look who's an atheist, you know? But, uh, yeah, he, he was something. He was something. You would have been um, older than Reverend King by what? By about... Uh, oh, I think so, yeah, he was a kid. He was young. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you weren't terribly old yourself. Yeah, well, but... Yeah, he would have, you'd probably been about 10 years a senior. I, I think. think so, yeah, 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 yeah. How about recollections of um, folks like uh, Ralph Abernathy or Andy Young? Yeah, I, I, I remember them. I remember, I remember uh, Jim Foreman uh, that night. He was uh, leaning up against the, the fireplace, you know, when we were talking about politics, I remember. I was quoting to Dr. King, Lenin's one step forward and two steps back, a very important uh, uh, pamphlet. And we were talking about that in terms of, you know, how, how uh, politics moves forward, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah, I remember them, yeah. Did you I don't know if this I don't know if this has a fixed answer or not, but in a, here we are in the spring of '65. You're in the middle of a situation as uncertain as the one in Selma, laden with all of this not just threat of violence but active violence as a country. Oh yeah! Well, oh it? yeah! Um, that was did you have a did you have a frame of mind about race relations in this country that made you optimistic or uncertain? Didn't or think about it. I did. A, didn't think I did do a job. I did my job. I, I, I was hoping. I was hoping it. Listen, I never expected to change the world, but uh, yeah. one step forward, two steps back. Listen, the road between Selma and the White House. Yeah. Yeah. I played a moment in history. Moment. That's right. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. Um, were you still in Selma when the march departed that would continue on to Montgomery? The third one, no. Yeah. No, I had already left, yeah. yes. Yeah. They had brought back down, some more people came, they brought down uh, gas masks, and I remember uh, uh, marching. And on the picture you will see, uh, I've, got the, I've got Dr. King's gas mask uh, under my coat. Uh, I don't know where they found it, uh, where my, my grandson found that picture, but you will see in the shot if you have it, if you haven't looked at it. Uh, yeah. So when you were walking right there with King, the idea was that um, 
you would have, as best as was possible in such a kind of mobile fluid situation, you would have something at hand to mm -hmm. do your best to protect him. Right. Yeah. 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 My, my job at that time was to protect him. Yeah. Yes. 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 Was there ever any prospect of someone else being in that role? Why did you emerge as the person in that role? Do you know? I took it. I guess I was the senior mm. physician down there, mm. Mm. and uh, at the role I assigned myself. Yeah, yeah. What can you tell me about some of the women who were down in nursing roles? Yeah, lovely. <laughs> yeah, Jeannie, Jeannie. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a number of women there who went, who stayed with the movement, became very important. Mike married one of them. Uh, I've seen her since then. You mean Mike Holland? Mike, yeah, Mike's wife. Uh, I'm blocking her name. There was the doctor there, lovely English accent. There was a nurse who lives in the next building to mine right now. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, have, mm -hmm. I block names. I just, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you feel, uh, the, you know, King, obviously? Dr. King and SCLC and that part of the spectrum of the movement, you know, spoke much about trying to, um, obviously from this kind of inside a Christian faith perspective, talked about the beloved community and so forth. Did you? I never paid attention. I, I'm sorry? I never paid attention to any Christological, uh, I, I didn't hear, I don't remember hearing any. Mm. I, remember, I really don't. Mm. I really don't. I really, if this was a, yeah, the Christian leadership. I, 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 I didn't seem to be. Well no, there. I had, had no, no interest in it, and I wasn't. I didn't hear it. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And don't forget, there was a lot of. I remember a meeting that I helped organize, which was a seminal meeting in the United States. It never had happened before, and it probably will never happen again. I had on the stage of a auditorium in Washington, D.C., the head of the NAACP, the core, the SCLC, uh, you name it, every major, every major Afro-American, that was the first and only time in the history of American, <laughs> Afro-Americans that they were all on the one stage at one time. Never forget that. And what was the context? I don't remember. It was a meeting we held. For the committee? For the committee, yeah. 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 Would that have been perhaps the first annual meeting? Before the second one was in Chicago in the spring of 66? Yeah, no, Chicago is a different thing. No, no. Yeah. Oh, yes, before that, yes. Do you think it might have been the first annual meeting? It may have yeah. been. It yeah. may have been. It may have been. Because, yeah. of course, Reverend King was the keynote of yes, that, yeah. the second one in Chicago. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I had trouble at the second one. Yeah, right. Did, um, and we'll talk about that at mm -hmm. the limit that you're interested in. Mm. I, I, I find myself, I, it's, it's, it's interesting, I, I ask about kind of your frame of mind and perspective, and you say, no, Joe, it was, we were there, we were in the moment doing this work, and that's kind of was our, what, what was in front of us. Um, I was about to ask again, thinking about the Voting Rights Act, of course, would follow Selma six, five, six months later. Um, the Civil Rights Act had followed the earlier. Um, but you've also been in the middle of things so close to, so close to the real pressures and tensions, say, that are represented by, as you, as you refer to Washington and the pressures brought, say, by the national government on King, say, in that Selma second March moment to cut a deal. What was your perspective about the, the, the federal government in these years on these questions, and I'm also thinking of how that will broaden to the question of your perspective on medical care in the United States in relation to the state and government and so forth. I think we're in trouble. Mm. Have been, will be. Mm. Not in my lifetime anymore, though. We had a chance. We had a chance, and politics was triumphant, not reality. We have the worst, one of the worst medical systems in the world. 
we spend more money, produce less, cause more problems than any place in the world. People refuse Bismarck. Bismarck invented socialized medicine, you know? 150 years ago, and, and, and we, we, we can't get anything done. It's ridiculous, but maybe. I don't think in my, I don't think in my grandchildren's time, maybe my great-grandchildren, maybe, maybe, who knows, who knows. No. Money talks. Financing would be one of the great difficulties that the committee would face, say. Oh, yeah. It became extreme. And, and I, I want to ask about how at the meeting in March of 66, uh, Vietnam had also become a question. So do we, do we take up that issue as the committee or do we not? Can you talk about well, that? Well, I was opposed to war. Uh, my wife and sons marched against the war. I donated money against the war. I joined organizations. But I didn't think the medical committee had a right to that because there were people giving us money that were for the war. I can't turn around and take their money and use it for things that they didn't believe in. It wasn't correct. Don't forget, Dr. King didn't come out against the war until much later, okay? I didn't think that was my job or my business at that time. My job was to take care of the medical needs, to lend a medical presence. I wasn't there to raise money to fight the Vietnam. There are other organizations in other places, and I split with them on that. The young ones wanted that. I wasn't that old at the time, but I guess for them I was antediluvian already. <laughs> sure, let's pause for We're back after a short break. Dr. Mulvan, I wanted to ask, um, can you describe, obviously there were, there were a range of discussions that continued on many issues. We've talked about Vietnam. There was also the question of, should the committee somehow shift its strategies and approaches to become a mechanism for beginning to deliver frontline health care to African Americans, not just a movement view. Well, I think I think I didn't I didn't clarify one situation. There were two elements in the medical motivations of the medical committee. There were two groups of people. There were people like me who were interested in the civil rights movement, qua civil rights, while writing wrote. There were very important people who went on to very important positions in American medicine who founded medical organizations down south, some of which still exist. And they, I don't know how many of them are still alive. I remember Jack Geiger, who was a very important writer and ideologue for medical care. Uh, there were others, others, I don't block their names, uh, but I think they are described in, in Dittmer's book. Uh, I was not part of that. I, I knew very little about it, and quite frankly, I paid very little attention to it. I'm, I'm not a, I was not a, uh, what word should I use? I, I wasn't interested in establishing medical clinics or things of that sort, although, although my office in East Harlem uh, <laughs> was doing that job. I did that job for myself. I, I wasn't going down south to start, to start uh, uh, a practice down there. I, I, I'm, I had my Harlem. And uh, I really wasn't interested in it. Maybe, but maybe it was wrong. I'm, I'm sure it was wrong. But when I raised money, I, I raised money to do things for the movement, not to, not to, not to establish. I, 
It may have been an error. I, I don't regret it. I, I did my. I did what I had to do. How I had to do it. I was not involved in that. And there was a major dichotomy later on that had to do with it, with that. You know, they wanted money to establish clinics. I wanted money to pay for doctors and dentists and and and, and nurses and people to go down south. So, yeah. different different outlooks. Yeah. Your direct and active uh, involvement with the committee wound down in 66? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, were you active in formal organizations around broadly the, the politics of health care in years subsequent? In a small sense, and I'm not, not directly. Yeah. No, I went to things that, you know, again, when, when, when Columbia was occupied by the kids. I went to Columbia, to the campus, uh, uh, and, you know, to lend a medical presence. I know I made a very intemperate speech uh, the following day, and I remember, uh, what's her name again, taking me to task for my intemperate speech. I called the police pigs. And, uh, I was young, I was mad, it was a terrible, terrible thing to see what they had done to the kids protesting at Columbia. Margaret Mead yeah. called me out, you know, but, uh, and I, listen, I flew to Israel when the Scud started flying, right? So I went to Israel when the Scud, why? To show them I was there, mm. you know, uh, I could stop anything, I could do anything. But I went there to, yeah. you know. The Scud missiles, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, 91? Right, yeah, you know, so I, you know, I took the first plane they would let me out. Yeah. yeah. So I could be there with my friends and my family. Absolutely. I have a big family in this room. Absolutely, absolutely. Just to lend my presence. Yeah, absolutely. But, but looking back at all this, what, is there an, uh, uh, maybe a foolish question, is there an, is there an answer to why you... Uh, I live by a rule, justify your existence. Justify your existence. Have there been other um, parts of the broad social justice spectrum in subsequent years that have really captured your attention? That's a very peculiar way to I haven't been actively involved. Yeah. You caught my attention. Yes, I, I, I suffered through the, the joke of the, of the health care bill. You know, a joke. Uh, what can I tell you? All in due time, but my time is up, so I won't see anything. Any other final thoughts or issues we haven't touched upon? Not that I know of. I know. Dr. Moore, it's just such a privilege and a real honor to spend this time with you. Thank you so much for sitting down with us. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.